Hello, and welcome to our webcast. I'm Amy Pendergrass with Moss Adams, and I'm going to get us started for today's session, PPP Loan Forgiveness and ERTC for Government Contractors. The presentation you are about to see isn't legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. And before we begin, I'm going to play a brief housekeeping video. Welcome, and thanks for joining us. We're pleased to present another in our ongoing series of continuing professional education webcasts to help companies and individuals conquer challenges as they plan for what's next. Our presentation will start in a few moments. Before we begin, here are a few things to keep in mind. You can customize how you both view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can also adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls at the top of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons, each relating to a different aspect of our session. You can download the group attendance sheet and a PDF copy of today's slides from the slide deck and handouts widget to the right of the slide view. You can ask our presenter questions during the webcast by typing a question in the Q&A window below the slide view and clicking Submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions during the presentation or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty during today's presentation, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. All right, today's webcast is eligible for 1.5 CPE credits and for the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy. To qualify for these credits, you must attend for a minimum of 75 minutes and respond to at least five of the six polling questions. And now that we have all of that out of the way, I would like to turn the floor over to one of today's presenters, Sheila Herrera. Thank you, Amy. Um, for those of you that are not familiar, we're just going to do a brief introduction here of both mine and Dave's companies that we work for. Um, so for those of you not familiar with Moss Adams, we have more than 3,800 professionals across more than 30 locations in the West and beyond. We work with many of the world's most innovative companies and leaders. Our strength is that middle market, um, which enables us to advise clients at all you know, levels of um, from startup to rapid growth and expansion to transition. As you can see from the list below, Moss Adams is a fully integrated professional firm um, dedicated to assisting clients in various industries and providing various accounting, tax, and consulting services. Uh, we understand that government contractors are unique and that you must not only know, you know, GAP and the FAR, but you also have various, you know, entities that you respond to. And so it's important for us and, and to take the time today to provide this information as a way to show not only what we know, but a way that you know, our clients can ask questions along the way. Dave, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Sheila. Uh, a little bit about Redstone Government Consulting. Uh, we are a team of experts of about under 50 uh, overall and we're um, a team of experts that can assist and support government contractors with government contract compliance, proposal pricing, contract and subcontract administration, HR consulting, accounting system implementation, and accounting outsourcing. Since you know a little bit about Moss Adams and a little bit about Redstone, I'd like to turn it over to Sheila to actually do her personal introduction. Thanks, Dave. Um, I have actually been in public accounting since 2006. Um, I primarily work with government contractors and other professional service firms um, that have government contracts or grants. Um, so providing a wide range of services from financial statement audits, reviews, compilations, um, various accounting pronouncement implementation. We do FAR indirect cost audits. Um, and so working with clients through any kind of research resolution or implementation, if you will, of just understanding the accounting or if they're subject to any FAR requirements, helping to answer any questions that they might have along the way. And then Dave, if you want to introduce yourself. I'm Dave Fix, and I've been with Redstone for nearly a year. 
after retiring from the Defense Contract Audit Agency, or DCAA, after about 35 years of uh, going from an auditor to regional audit manager. Uh, as it, it, at the last couple of years of my career, in addition to being a regional audit manager or a RAM, I was also an adjunct instructor at DCA at Defense Contract Audit Institute, the Institute for DCAA's training. And I was an adjunct instructor for the onboarding course or the first technical course that DCA auditors will take. Uh, in addition to my DCA career, I'm also an Air Force Reser uh, retired reservist where I served, uh, my last duty station was at uh, Air Force uh, Reserve Command Headquarters and I served as the Chief of Contracting Inspections. I'd like to go over the agenda, a little bit what we're gonna focus on as far as uh, our webinar today. And we're gonna look at the Federal Acquisition Regulation and especially one that's maybe a key focus here to, uh, to basically looking at credits. And the reason for looking at credits is that if you were actually able to bill on your, your ongoing uh, contract cost, and then you got uh, perhaps payroll protection program uh, forgiveness, the government wants to share in that. And there's a one sentence FAR citation probably one of the few that are fit that short. And FAR 31-201-5 is called credits. And it's the applicable portion of any income, rebate, allowance, or other credit relating to any allowable cost and received by or accruing to the contractor shall be credited to the government either as a cost reduction or cash refund. Once again, one sends underlying theme to this, you, you will see this again in the webinar as well. Uh, we'll look at PPP and its impacts to your government contracts. We'll look at what uh, PPP treatment and what to maybe expect what DCA will actually be looking for as far as your treatment. And uh, it's in particular things like incurred cost submissions and forward pricing. And Sheila will go into the employee retention tax credit. Moving on to the coronavirus aid, coronavirus aid relief and economic security or CARES Act. Uh, it was, some, it was a, 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 a law enacted in March, 2020, provided aid and relief in response to the national health emergency. And it has four main sections, but what we're going to focus on here is the second and third bullet, the Paycheck Protection Program or PPP and the Employee Retention Tax Credit. And one, one thing that there may be is that perhaps there may be a, a myth that you can only get one of these. And that's not correct. Uh, you, need some, you need perhaps some planning, but you uh, will be eligible for both. Uh, one of the caveats is that you just can't use um, dollars that you use for PPP for the employee retention tax credit. And once again, these are two things that are significant that we are seeing in our clients, and especially one that is probably more common to hear about is the PPP and maybe not so much the ERTC. And this is maybe a benefit to actually being able to look at uh, both in this, web in this webinar. First off, what is PPP? PPP is, is, uh, came out of the CARES Act and it's administered and implemented from the Small Business Administration. And it's designed to provide loans and direct incentive for small businesses to keep their workers on the payroll. Uh, the, proceeds are, the proceeds are used for payroll cost, costs related to continuation of group health care benefits, employee salaries, and other uh, commissions and similar compensations, payments on interest and mortgage obligations, rent, utilities, interest or other debt obligations that were, were incurred before the covered period, and PPP loan uh, limits wages to 100,000, which should be prorated based on the period. So this is just a little bit of understanding of what PPP is. Also, PPP to be forgiven, uh, the funds must be used for payroll cost, interest on mortgages, rents and utilities with the other caveat that 
least 60% of the forgiven amount must be used for payroll. Borrowers are generally eligible for forgiveness uh, of the costs incurred during the covered period. And hopefully by now, most of you have gone through the exercise related to how you record that PPP loan in your financial statements. Some of you may have followed ASC 470, which means that the PPP loan should be recorded as a liability um, in accordance you know, with that ASC 470 upon receipt of the funds. Um, interest should be accrued and expensed over the term of the loan in accordance with the interest method similar to any other bank loan or interest bearing liability. And then you would have the extinguishment of the PPP loan um, once the entity has been legally released from you know, being the primary obligator under that liability. So once the bank releases that debt from you, then that forgiveness or that extinguishment of the PPP loan happens. Um, and then any amount forgiven would be recognized as a gain on the extinguishment. And then you would have disclosures um, related to both the accounting policy for that PPP loan and the related impact to the financial statements. Um, some year that, you know, you might have a debt disclosure there, and then you would have the follow-up year where that forgiveness um, actually happened. And then some of you went the other way, which followed IAS 20. So this is the in substance government grant. Um, there are some significant hurdles here though, to be eligible to account for the PPP loan as an in substance grant. Um, there must be reasonable assurance that your loan will be forgiven and that you meet all the requirements on the loan application, including providing the, necessi the necessity for that loan. Um, once you receive that reasonable assurance or you can get comfortable with that reasonable assurance, the earning impact of the government grant is then recorded um, on a systematic basis over the periods in which that entity recognizes the expenses um, for those costs. And so you would recognize that PPP loan as a deferred income liability um, and then you would reduce that liability and recognize the income on that systematic basis. And so you would have um, a credit to the income statement as a separate line under the general heading, such as other income, or as a reduction to the related expenses. Um, you would also have disclosures included in the financial statements related to the PPP loan if you choose to also go down this method. Um, and then you would have any you know, significant terms and conditions along with any estimates that were made, any contingencies um, that are also related to you know, what is expected from the SBA side. And so the, depending on the policy that you've elected, um, it's important to understand that your GAAP financial statements may or may not match your tax returns. Um, you'll re be required to disclose, like I mentioned, the accounting policy for the loan and the related impact to the financial statements, regardless of the accounting treatment applied. But once you adopt a policy, you cannot kind of change it in the next year. So if you go um, down the road of adopting ASC 470 in year one, you can't go into year two and change it to be this IAS 20. And then if you also have a multiple PPP loans, if you have an accounting policy for one PPP loan, then the policy should also follow that second PPP loan. From a government contractor perspective, we have seen just a lot of questions here from our clients, um, especially you know those that maybe have different types of contracts, different types of reporting that needs to be done to the government. Um, it's also possible that your book gap accounting will be different than what you report to the government. And we'll go through that in a minute. Amy, it looks like we have a polling question to start here. All right, thank you. So our first polling question is a true or false. A PPP should always be recorded as debt on the financial statements until it is forgiven. 
A, true, or B, false? And we will give you a few moments to respond. Uh, to respond, please click the button next to the answer you choose and then hit submit. And if you can't see the submit button, you will need to enlarge your slides. We'll leave this up another few seconds here. All right, here are the results. Thanks, Amy. And so again, you you can have um, the the PPP loan not be necessarily be recorded as debt if you meet that IAS twenty criteria. You could end up you know recording some of that in your income statement. And so it's a good idea to work through what that might look like if you haven't already. A big item that's come up along the way here is record keeping. How are you keeping your records to show the necessity of your PPP loan? Um, the SBA has a five-year statute of limitations and has already said it will review everything over this $2 million mark. As a result of the SBA review, if you know adequate, if the adequate basis for the required certification. Um, if there's a question regarding the necessity of the loan, you know, that isn't found by the SBA, um, they can, you know, seek repayment of that outstanding PPP loan. Um, they will, you know, inform the lender that the borrow, borrower isn't eligible for loan forgiveness. Um, and then, you know, they could come back and say that there could be issues with any necessity of the loan request. And so you might have to respond to the SBA um, and that loan guarantee that maybe was was kind of in place where you thought you, you know, had it buttoned up, that might come into question as well. Um, so again, they can choose to audit anything um, above, they will say, they will, you know, audit everything above that two million, but they can choose to audit also anything below the two million. Um, the other thing to keep in mind here is the FAR 31-201-2D. Um, it's also important to revisit as far as responsibility for the record keeping and maintaining adequate support um, that FAR requires for contractors. You want you must demonstrate that claim cost um, comply with the applicable cost principles. And so how do you do that as a good question and just making sure that you have documentation to support any kind of answer here. And so it's important to understand, you know, what type of contracts that you have. Um, some of you have federal or state contracts that are required to follow the FAR here. Um, you will want to understand, you know, what types of contracts you have. So taking any kind of inventory along the way during the years that you got the PPP loan, along with the years that you received PPP loan forgiveness. Um, when you have the cost type contracts, um, you are getting reimbursed for costs typically, um, plus a fee, any kind of fixed price contracts. This is where you have your set dollar value for the scope of work performed, regardless of how much cost you kind of put into that contract. And then your time and materials contracts, you know, when you're invoiced based on a rate and usually bill materials based on actual cost. Um, why is it, you know, important to understand and take inventory of your contracts? Um, you may or may not have all heard this, you know, term called double dipping. Um, Dave alluded to it a little bit earlier um, in the more professional sense of the word, if you will. But the double dipping criteria, it's important because the base, the government is basically wanting to make sure that you don't get reimbursed from government dollars twice for the same cost. And so a little bit later, Dave will go through why this is important based on your contracts you received and, and really how to understand what that, how that impacts you. Okay, thanks, Sheila. And um, one of the things is to go through what is the government contracts and treatment of 
PPP loan forgiveness. And the contract types impa impacted by loan forgiveness payback are cost type contracts. All costs forgiven must be credited back to the government. Once again, reinforcing that, that one sentence FAR citation, FAR 31, 201-5 credits. And also looking at what Sheila mentioned too was the time and material contracts. Looking at the time part is a fixed rate, but the M will be something that will be a burden actual cost. The fixed price contracts, commercial contracts, not impacted. So the thing is, is to look at your contract types, know what you have, just as uh, Sheila suggested, know the inventory type that you have and know how this is impacted uh, by, the, uh, by the contract types. And Amy, it looks like we have a polling question. All right, thanks, Dave. So the second polling question is, what type of government contracts do you have the most of? A, uh, cost-type contracts, B, fixed-type contracts, C, time and materials contracts, or D, commercial? And as you respond, uh, just a reminder that if you would like to receive CPE for today's webcast, you will need to respond to at least five of the six polling questions. And I do see some coming through the Q&A window. Uh, you will need to put your responses on the slides for it to track your progress. All right, here are the results. Okay, I'll comment on that. It looks like we got kind of a mix of things here, looking at uh, uh, more than 30% cost type, uh, fixed type contracts, 31 and time material contracts with 21% and commercial 17. So we have more than half the cost type contracts and the time material contracts that will be impacted, uh, approximately just about 51.4%. So that's something that uh, to uh, keep in mind and keep in mind how you need to uh, respond to that. So we've seen instances, you know, where some of our clients have been reading various articles, getting various advice, and have seen where they either requested a partial forgiveness um, or they did not submit the correct documentation and the SBA actually came back and said, we are only going to award partial forgiveness. And so it's important to understand as you start to report back to the government, um, really, whether you received the full forgiveness or you received a partial forgiveness. Um, it's also important to understand which costs and contracts relate to that partial forgiveness. You'll need to know that as you, you know, move forward in reporting back to the government and even moving, you know, forward in, in your indirect cost calculations and how those costs would relate. Okay, thanks, Sheila. The next uh, four or five slides, I'm going to go through a small business uh, administration Office of Inspector General um, report that just came out in uh, uh, February 2022. And this evaluated the PPP program, uh, how it was responding back uh, to uh, its 90-day uh, decision of loan forgiveness. And the reason why this is important is that, you know, I'll get into this in the following slides, is that they can actually, uh, the Small Business Administration can do a retroactive uh, review for fraud. And as I get into a couple of those slides, we'll look at what you need to do, uh, what they did, and what they changed, and its implications to you and why it's important. So the first thing starts, at, it's in your bucket. Uh, what, what do you do? Well, the borrower submits a loan forgiveness application to their lender, and then it goes from the lender for their action, has 60 days to review the application, decide on loan forgiveness, and issue a forgiveness decision to the Small Business Administration. Small Business Administration has a uh, 90 days after receiving it to make a, uh, a forgiveness decision, which is a statutory requirement of that 90 days. What SBA did on its initial loan review process, uh, October 2020, is that they used an automated tool to identify uh, on screen all 5.2 million PPP loans. And uh, from this, 
1.96 million, approximately 37%, uh, were being flagged with hold codes that triggered potential man, uh, manual review. SBA used data analytics on completed manual reviews to identify groups of loans with characteristics that indicated minimal noncompliance that could be resolved or class of reclassified as not needing a manual review. And some of this could be, for example, uh, it was just not a material amount to move forward. Uh, the loans with unresolved hold codes, uh, such as Bauer's criminal record or business affiliation issues, are manually reviewed by government contractors. SBA contracted out to have this review uh, to assist them in the, in the uh, numbers of review loans that they actually had to go through. The objective of the contractor manual review is to identify and resolve hold codes through a review of the loan data, research, and requests for documentation. Uh, from the contractor's manual review, they went into two buckets. No further action, going smoothly back to SBA, and also requires further action. And that's one that uh, SBA would have to do something with. SBA manually reviewed the hold codes with require further uh, requires further action from the government contractor review, uh, two million or greater, and did a statistically valid sample of loans, basically using three strata that they used uh, for that statistical sample. Uh, loans disp disposition with no further action were given forgiveness, uh, forgiven for a uh, recommended amount without SBA manual review, unless they also met, uh, unless they met some other criteria. Well, SBA changed their loan process review and mainly because they weren't hitting the statutory requirement for all uh, forgiveness decisions. Uh, they weren't make it, they were making it somewhere in about the 90 percentage, 90 uh, percent of the reviews within 90 days, but there were some they were not. So they knew they had to do better and they uh, made basically another review process. They ended their manual reviews of all loans, uh, two million or greater. SBA will review uh, loans of two million and greater with unresolved hold codes. Those are ones that required further action from the, uh, uh, from the contractor review. And they did a statistically valid sample of loans to Maine and greater. The SBA loan said the changes to help the agency meet the 90-day statutory requirement to remit for, uh, forgiveness payments to lenders and cited three benefits. One being the better ability to target fraud. And I, I emphasize that target fraud uh, where they can retroactively go back and look at that. And it was a better use of government resources and an alleviation of Bauer uncertainty. SBA's management, uh, management's new approach includes some cases of forgiving loans prior to performing any manual reviews. As a result, SBA will have to pursue the Bauer to repay funds, which could, could prove to be challenging and resulting in taxpayer funds being spent on el ineligible loans. Small Business Administration Office of Inspector General had some concerns in the impact of, of the change. OIG had concerns about the review changes and impact these changes have on ability to recover funds for forgiven loans later determined to be ineligible. Outstanding loan forgiveness applications a potential fraud indicator. Borrowers who fraudulently or ineligible obtain PPP loans are unlikely to apply for loan forgiveness. Love, they just will leave it the way it is. Uh, changes to the program requirements for Schedule C borrowers, that's off of IRS Form 1040, Schedule C, where they were used for um, that information for qualifying for loans, uh, generally being for those that were uh, sole proprietors or ones that did not have employees, uh, many employees and operated off of the Schedule C, may increase uh, risk of fraudulent loans. Many of the loans made to Schedule C borrowers were made by lenders who relied exclusively on third-party processing or software platform vendors they hired. So why is this important? Why is it a big deal? Well, SBA is going to be doing retroactive manual reviews, and the SBA is going to be reviewing for fraud. So when they're looking for that, that could be something that you want to be aware of that they're going to be doing. 
So you want to keep your records. Uh, as Sheila mentioned, you want to keep these records for the period of five years. You want to have questions regarding eligibility should be reviewed uh, by you closely, especially since they could be looking for a fraud. Uh, reviewed SBA retroactive manual review communications and what's being asked and what you and your lender relied upon about at the time of the loan. Uh, as needed, consider your uh, consider the need for legal counsel. And uh, one of the things is that uh, one of the things to consider here is uh, do no further harm. Uh, don't send something that uh, may support or may look like fraud because you are trying to respond to questions. Uh, maybe consider consulting uh, your legal counsel and watch what is said or being forwarded to SPA. Uh, regarding loan eligibility questions and what you and your lender relied upon at that time. And then what, what actually happens, you know, if you actually go through the PPP loan, everything is forgiven, but then you find you are in a double dipping situation um, where you would potentially have to pay back the, the loan forgiveness credit. Um, so a few steps here, you'll need to include a credit offset for the entire amount on the current invoice. Um, you'll need to make sure to discuss with your contracting officer, um, you know, what's going on. There could be an agreement um, that they might want to put in place to help alleviate that cash flow burden that you could have. Um, for example, you could be in a situation where the contract work is no longer ongoing and you will need to determine how to pay back those dollars. Um, we have seen payment plans get created with those contracting officers just to help alleviate that cash flow burden if that you know, loan forgiveness credit needs to be paid back in any shape or form here. And then if you do, you know, owe the government back money, have you really gone through and figured out how this truly impacts your financial statements? Um, you will have, you know, a liability that we need to get recorded on your financial statements for the amount that would need to be owed back to the government, um, whether that's, you know, to the SBA or that's the credit that would need to be placed back to the contractor. Um, you will also need to understand when that contract revenue was originally recorded, was it in this fiscal year or was it in a prior fiscal year? And how, how material it could be to your financial statements will be key. Um, you'll wanna have those conversations as soon as you know about any potential issue with either the SBA um, providing that loan forgiveness um, or coming back and saying, okay, we've completed the audit. We, we think you owe some money here. Um, or if you have a situation where you have a double dipping issue, um, you'll want to have those conversations with your consultant or, you know, your CPA along the way here to make sure um, that you've kind of gone through all those considerations related to the financial statements and what should be um, being discussed with that contracting officer. Okay, we're going to kind of move to what to expect from DCAA. And uh, the guidances I'm, I'm showing right now, there are two guidances that DCA is showing on its public website, on its public website, not its internal website, which uh, uh, we don't have access to. Uh, and basically the two guidances that are going back to, uh, going back to 2021, uh, more than a year ago, uh, one was a revised uh, alert on coronavirus legislation and regulations. And it was uh, what you would see typically DCA uh, guidance being uh, an MRD, which is a mem memorandum for regional director. And uh, the 20 uh, indicating the, uh, it, it, the, the year and it coming out of PIC, which is basically out of a policy organization out of uh, DCAA. It provides guidance. It gives table formats of the legislations uh, related to coronavirus and the CARES Act. Uh, it also focuses on some FAQs, uh, frequently asked questions, uh, looking at incurred costs and forward pricing. And uh, those can be easily going through the DCA website uh, to be able to get to those. Uh, another one, the second one there, is one that usually isn't seen as a, um, 
as a uh, typical guidance of the memorandum for regional directors or the MRDs. And it's one that basically you had to go through the website and find frequently asked questions to be able to go to find. And this one actually gives some practical applications and gives a very simplified example on how to implement uh, uh, credits with again that underlying theme being the FAR 31201-5, which is credits, that one sentence, uh, one I, I uh, spoke about earlier in the webinar. And this guidance is frequently asked questions. Uh, it gets down to the government should re receive credit uh, reduction in any billing for PPP loans or loan payments that are forgiven uh, to take away from that double dipping that uh, Sheila was speaking about. And DCA provides, again, that simple example. It gives even some, some pictures of how to do this. And it really comes down to two things. It's really, you exclude the forgiven amounts in the pool, uh, um, the, um, uh, the numerator of the, of the fraction, and you include, you don't uh, decrease the forgiven amount from the base or the denominator of the, uh, of the rate. And direct costs are forgiven and then are adjusted uh, for any particular burdens uh, in the calculations of rates after the fact. Why am I just showing you these two guidances? This is what to expect from DCAA. Again, once again, that underlying theme here is that the government's expecting credit for uh, anything that's coming back that's given amount, whether it's gonna be uh, an employee retention tax credit. These also, these two guidances really just focus on the PPP as opposed to the ERTC, the Employee Retention Tax Credit. Uh, but one of the things you have to think about, this is what DCAA may do, and it might be their expectation of what uh, they're suggesting you to do. But depending on your situation, it may not fit into this. And this is DCAA guidance as a way to look at it. And it, it doesn't mean you, uh, if your situation, you may have to show it differently. But it's one that the DCAA for example, when you submit your incurred cost submission and then 60, and then DCA has 60 days to review that for adequacy, that they're going to be looking at it for something like this. So if you are going to depart from something that that DCA expectation, uh, make sure you have a solid foundation that you can, you can justify for your departure of what they actually expected. And it could be because your situation is unique to your organization, your company, and you need to present it in a different way. But again, looking to get that uh, uh, adherence to that FAR 31201-5 with credits. Again, there's that one sentence one that uh, I've been alluding to at least a couple times. And uh, uh, basically that's where it is. One whole sentence, kind of a long sentence, but it's one sentence. Again, looking that you are not benefiting from double dipping into getting paid one under contract cost and two also getting paid for the same cost through a loan forgiveness or a uh, particular tax credit that you may be able to have. This is actually going through a, a little bit of uh, what we had in a uh, Redstone March uh, webinar uh, where we actually took the where the rubber meets the road on uh, on actually a uh, uh, on one on an incurred cost submission, and again looking at that uh, you know rent where it's a, one of those it's a cost that you can use for PPP loan forgiveness, and you can see where it's in red right there uh, having the rent forgiven as uh, what was part of the loan forgiveness that it was applied to rent a cost. What I would also sit there and say what's missing here is where you have, to the far right, you have uh, notes and a reference. I would suggest being able to have some notes on that or have a reference on it to give a clear audit trail to be able to see where uh, that uh, rent was part of the uh, uh, PPP loan uh, that was actually forgiven and be able to take that uh, and be able to, so the DCA auditors can actually see that when they do their adequacy determination. The next one I'm basically showing again, a pool cost uh, on the part in the above slide. And I also show two kind of uh, red X's where it's in the base itself. And that's again, where you leave it in the base, you don't do a base reduction on that is what the guidance, what DCA is looking at. 
And again, this is for a PPP loan. It's not necessarily saying it for ERTC. You could perhaps use it for anything that you uh, use in the same kind of methodology for ERTC. But I would caveat with this to see how that actually falls into play with, again, that underlying premise. You're trying to show that the, you're giving the government credit for something that you have as far as the PPP loan forgiveness or the uh, ERTC. So again, looking at that decrease in the pool, but you're not adjusting the base. And this is going to come in a little bit. I think this is a, uh, a picture file that might take a little bit of time to come in. Let me go back, let me go forward. Okay, I'm looking for that to come in. Uh, this will be one, another uh, picture that uh, is coming in. There it is. Okay, thank you for your patience on that. Uh, this really wasn't that big a file that uh, I took here. It was a, uh, a pick file. One of the things I just want to be able to show is that second column from the right where it has a uh, forgiven amount and where you can actually show it by the uh, basically the um, account and you can see where it's shown as a, a reduction to that pool. So when you have that and, and this is going into uh, the calculation for rates, so you can see that it has uh, uh, Schedule B in the incurred of cost electronically or what's called the ICE model uh, that is uh, uh, used uh, significantly by um, uh, government contractors uh, as an ease to uh, uh, being able to do your incurred cost uh, submissions. And this is one, again, adding that column there to show that loan forgiveness. And to Amy, I think we have a polling question. All right, thank you. So the third polling question is a true or false. SBA's uh, new PPP review process will focus on review of fraudulent loans, among other review criteria. And your options are true or false. And then I would also like to remind you that you can submit questions uh, for Sheila and Dave through the Q&A window. And we do have quite a bit of content to cover today. So if we don't have time to respond during the webcast, uh, we will follow up with you afterwards. All right, here are the results. Okay, great. Uh, I think everybody kind of caught that. And that was one of the key things I had from the uh, SBA Office of Inspector General report in, the, uh, in February of 2022. Great, great. Uh, looking at the DCA guidance, it was uh, in the Memorandum for Regional Director of the MRD. It also looked at forward pricing. And one of the things with the, uh, with the CARES Act is to take a look at what it might do to your historical cost. If you have uh, something where you're uh, showing a uh, reduction in, for example, the rent cost, is this something that you, is going to be something you'll see in the future? So it's things when if you look at costs incurred during the calendar year, years 2020, 2021, uh, and if it's used for a basis of estimate for a proposal for future cost, uh, you need to understand how those costs incurred and are impacted by CARES Act and, uh, and what impact they have to future estimates. So it's something to take a look at those historical costs as sometimes being a basis of estimate for a future cost. Uh, you also need to look at the cost or pricing data requirement Generally, this is factual information, and you can see the definition for cost or pricing data in FAR Part uh, 2101, which is definitions for uh, uh, definitely different contracting items. Uh, changes in operations incorporates the impact of any changes in policies or operations resulting from the pandemic and its impact to future cost. And it could be anything as far as the uh, increase of teleworking and maybe cost of uh, office costs that have uh, decreased as far as um, moving forward and projecting it as a future cost. 
proposal data should include cost for pricing data respecting, uh, reflecting prospective costs required to provide product or service during the defined period of performance. So again, that's uh, looking at what's going to be as far as uh, costs going forward. Changes in process implemented uh, during the COVID-19 period and the impact of future um, pricings. And it could be anything as far as, you know, things that you had to overcome uh, from people being away from the uh, away from the office. And it may be something that you have uh, uh, potentially more than just telework, but you had some changes in process and uh, uh, recording that those processes uh, may be more streamlined and maybe continue to be more streamlined in the future. Uh, one thing to caveat is uh, you uh, the details are needed. You just can't necessarily put a bottom line adjustment to COVID-19 and say, uh, this is, uh, I, I reduce it by 10%. Uh, you need to basically detail out uh, and provide the details for that. And FAR Part 15 also uh, documents, uh, well document the basis of estimate, including any contingencies uh, in accordance with FAR 31-205-7. And those contingencies come basically in two ways. Uh, one that you have uh, that are reasonably known uh, and, you can, and you can reasonably quantify and other ones that are uh, reasonably known but you may not be able to quantify. You need to take a look at those and you need to be able to take it with the first one that you can uh, reasonably uh, determine and reasonably quantify and it would be something perhaps like uh, rework that you have basically historical information on. Uh, the second one where you uh, may not be known, uh, but uh, not easily quantified, may be dealing with some sort of litigation. So uh, things to take into account in forward pricing uh, as far as looking at uh, anything as far as contingencies moving forward. Subcontractor considerations kind of in the same vein that if you have subcontractors that receive PPP loan forgiveness uh, or benefited from ERTC, are they showing that into their cost type contracts or, or the M part, the materials of a time and material contract? Uh, definitely for flexibly priced, looking back at that uh, common thing to share in the credits, uh, FAR 31201-5, that one sentence uh, kind of FAR citation. For forward pricing, uh, uh, were the uh, effects of uh, COVID-19 considered in any cost for pricing data, uh, changes in operations, anything that would uh, change its historical cost? If contingency used by subcontractors, again, uh, was it something that followed the 31205-7C with those two flavors of contingencies, one being reasonably known and it can be reasonably quantified and, and you would put those in and incorporate that into uh, your uh, uh, basis of estimate. The other one where it's known, no, quite unknown uh, and not easily quantified or you can't quantify like a litigation cost, you may, you, that's something as far as supplemental information, but not something to necessarily quantify. And so thinking through this, you know, is this process easy? Of course not. You know, it, there's never anything that's easy. You have a lot of data here with the loan forgiveness and it isn't presented in a manner that easily identifies what the credit amount should be for each specific contract or pool. Um, you may also have data related to your subcontractors as Steve, as Dave mentioned that you know, might be important as you're building out your costs and really understanding what is in those costs. Um, you might be the subcontractor where you, all, you know, have some reporting to the prime here um, that you maybe haven't thought through. And so making sure that that is being done timely and that, you know, all the contracts, um, those costs are really being accounted for and you really don't have situations where you could have a double dipping um, so you'll want to understand just all the puzzle pieces here um, related to the forgiveness credit, taking a look at what the differences are. You, it could be different for every contractor. Um, contractor A may look different than contractor B, and it may be because of the types of contracts that you have in place, the dollar value involved, how it affects the pools, um, whether you are the sub or the prime. And so really, again, thinking through what you need to understand in order to kind of get to the right answer here. 
Um, and then having some patience, you know, this is new for everyone and getting the DCAA or another agency to approve your indirect cost submission for any given fiscal year that, you know, it may require multiple discussions, data requests, or even some back and forth um, that they may have you, you know, add for potential updates or changes. Um, you'll need to make sure that you respond back timely to any requests that any, you know, the DCAA or any other agency has. And that again, going back to that documentation requirement that you really have documentation to support any position that you're taking along the way. Okay, when do contractors apply for forgiveness? And uh, per, uh, per DCA guidance, the, the year in which forgiveness was received. And uh, this is something that if you had it for 2020, you were probably not hearing as it's, it's, uh, it early as 2021. And I've actually heard of a client that had one for 2020, did not hear about its forgiveness till 2022. Uh, so. Uh, one of the things is that you, you you look at the DCA guidance, but the DCA guidance is looking at, you know, when it is uh, uh, when it is actually forgiven. You receive that forgiveness letter, and one of the things is uh, maybe this is a catch-all here is that if you have a change in contract mix uh, uh, and type and are significantly different, uh, uh, and apply the PPP loan in the in, in where the loan originated, most typically calendar year 2020, this may require revision or resubmission of your incurred cost proposal. Uh, again, this is something to have that discussion on it. And the one thing to, the underlying here, uh, thing here is to have that you're looking to provide credits to the government uh, in, a, in a way that uh, adheres to FAR 31201-5, that credits, and it's something that you may have uh, some significant change in this that you uh, may need to uh, uh, coordinate and, and substantiate and basically have that discussion uh, with uh, an agency like the Defense Contract Audit Agency and being able to have that and, and so they can have that information to take a look when taking into consideration and its adequacy determination that they generally do. Uh, well, they generally do that to within 60 days of receipt of the incurred cost uh, proposal. So again, it's one of the things that even though it's a DCA guidance, you have to assess your situation. You have to say that, it, does, this, does this clearly, will I be able to show the, uh, the credit to the government that, that it should get on this? And uh, the, again, to have that uh, discussion, perhaps put some uh, justification or some additional information as far as the narrative if you uh, depart from what DCA is going to expect on that. So this is one that, you know, how to apply that. And again, taking what you have into consideration, but the DCA is going to be looking at, uh, it's going to be in the year of its forgiveness when you receive that forgiveness letter. And Amy, we have a polling question. Okay, so our fourth polling question is true or false, any credit for ERC and PPP forgiveness should have audit support as well as an in, as an audit trail and an incurred cost submission. True or false? And then also for those of you that would like a copy of today's slides, you can download them now from the slide deck and handouts folder. And then we're also sending them via email tomorrow along with the recording of today's webcast. Move this up another five seconds. Okay, here are the results. Okay, great. I think everybody got that. Uh, that's one of the things to help your incurred cost uh, submission to uh, fly um, well through its, uh, uh, for example, a defense contract audience or DCA adequacy review of the incurred cost submission to have that audit trail where you can spell out uh, where it was uh, where it was uh, forgiven and where you applied the credit to it whether it be in a particular um, pool whether it be in a base whether it be a direct cost whether it be to commercial contracts 
uh, where you can where you can show that is providing that audit trail gives uh, visibility to how it was uh, how it was uh, spread through the uh, company and its impact to the overhead and also direct costs. Oh, Sheila, I believe you're on mute. Oh, thank you. We're going to go ahead and no jump problem. into the employee retention tax credits here. We've talked a lot about the PPP loans, and we're starting to see a lot of traction on the employee retention tax credits. Um, so what is the employee retention tax credit exactly? It was also established by the CARES Act, intended to help businesses um, retain their workforces and avoid layoffs during the pandemic. Um, it provides a per employee credit to eligible businesses based on a percentage of qualified wages and health insurance benefits paid to employees. It works as a refundable payroll tax credit that you would claim on quarterly 941s. Um, and so who is considered eligible for these credits? Um, there are two time periods to consider here. The first being um, March 13th through December 31st of 2020. And so there were some qualifications here um, where employers whose businesses were fully or partially suspended due to emergency orders from an appropriate government authority um, that limited any kind of commerce, travel, or group meetings. And we'll kind of go through what is partially suspended mean. Um, and then employers who had at least 50% reduction in gross receipts tax for the quarter, the calendar quarter as compared to the same calendar quarter in 2019. Um, we also have a second set of qualifications for another period here. And that starts January 1st, um, 2021 through September 30th, 2021. And so employers whose businesses were fully again or partially suspended um, due to emergency orders from that appropriate government authority and then employers who had at least 20% reduction in gross receipts for the current calendar quarter as compared to the same quarter in 2019. And so many businesses we've seen have ended up being eligible because of these emergency orders that were placed on them by various governing authorities, such as states that had very strict guidelines for significant periods of time. Um, we'll discuss, like I said, partial suspension in a minute. But once you determine that you are in fact eligible for employee retention tax credits, how do you go about kind of calculating what that potential credit is? And so the credit amount would be equal to 50% of the qualified wages that are paid to an employee after March 12, 2020 in each qualifying calendar quarter. So up to a total of 10,000 for all quarters per employee. The credit may be worth up to 5,000 per eligible employee um, qualified wages for the purpose of this program include a qualified health plan, expenses incurred by the employer, and employee pre-tax considerations. Um, the credit is equal to 70% of qualified wages paid to an employee after um, December 31st, 2020 in each qualifying calendar quarter up to a total of 10,000 for all quarters per employee. The credit may be worth up to 21,000 per eligible employee. Qualified wages for purposes of the program, again, include health plan expenses incurred by the employer and employee pre-tax contributions. And so here, going through what the guidance is on partial suspension of operations, um, the IRS issued further um, employee retention tax credits specific to 2020 in notice 2021-20, where gross receipts from the suspended operations um, comprise at least 10% of the total gross receipts. Um, hours of service performed by employees 
in the suspended operations account for at least 10% of total service hours. And then they clarified um, that changes to operations result in a reduction of at least 10% of the employer's ability to provide goods or services. And so once you've gone through determining that you are in fact eligible, you've calculated the credit, but then how do you go about claiming what that credit is? Um, most likely you're completing this after you've submitted a 941. Um, so you would claim the credit by filing an IRS form 941X um, that the, the IRS clarified that some of the wages used to calculate the employee retention tax credit can't be used to calculate other credits such as the work opportunity tax credit, the employer paid family and medical leave credit, um, any other disaster retention credits or um, R&D credits is typically a big one um, that we see where those costs um, might be incurred. And so you can't use, again, those same costs to then claim these credits um, on the employee retention tax credit. Um, the IRS also clarified that employees have three years from the date the original return was filed, which is your 941, or two years from the date that the taxes were paid um, to file that 941X. So as you're kind of moving through the timeline here, um, the 2020 period for some of these quarters will start to expire here. And so that first quarter is likely expired. Um, and then you will have quarters here that are going to start to also expire as you get through the next couple of months and through the end of the year. So really keep in mind, if you think you are eligible for some sort of employee retention tax credit, um, that you should really be working through what this calculation is. Um, you might want to have a conversation with your consultant or CPA. Um, they have been doing a lot of these um, credits for different types of employers, businesses, and just making sure that, you know, what you are thinking as far as, you know, what you qualify for makes sense in the sense that, you know, you are eligible under the IRS guidelines, that you meet this suspension requirement that, you know, you're doing the calculation of the gross receipts piece or the hours um, and that you really have, again, documentation to support any kind of credit that you may be taking. This will be important, especially from a government contractor perspective, as you move through what is actually being uh, refunded from the government here. And so there's a common misconception, if you will, out there that if you've already received PPP loan funds, that you do not qualify for the employee retention tax credits. Um, the Tax Relief Act of 2020 waived the exception for PPP loan recipients to also be able to claim that employee retention tax credit. Um, we have seen many clients that are able to go back and determine what qualified as PPP loan costs and what remains to determine if they meet the criteria to qualify for other quarters that were maybe not claimed as part of the PPP loan costs. Um, and so it's important, you know, as a business to understand kind of the rules related to this. Um, you may be able to go back and claim employee return pension um, tax credits to the extent that the business was experiencing a partial suspension of operations or if they meet the 50% reduction in the gross receipts test for those eligible quarters in 2020. Um, you may also qualify during the eligible 2021 quarters if you continue to experience that partial suspension of operations or met that 20% reduction in that gross receipts tax. Um, qualified wages for the employer retention tax credit don't include any wages that were paid um, from forgiven PPP proceeds. And so again, really being able to understand what costs were in that PPP loan, being able to separate them out um, and really, you know, having those conversations going through the calculation will be important if you are looking to claim any of these monies.
Amy, it looks like we have a polling question. Okay, so our fifth polling question. Are you in the process of applying for the ERTC? A, yes, we have applied. Uh, B, yes, we are in the process of applying. C, maybe we are unsure if we qualify. D, no, we have enough headaches with the PPP loans. Or E, no, we are concerned uh, related to the impact of the government contract. And we still have one more polling question uh, coming up, but once you've completed all CPE requirements, you will be able to download a PDF of your certificate from the CPE progress window. All right, let me close this one out. And here are the results. So it looks like we do have a mix here where we have some folks that have applied or are in the process of applying. Um, there's some that it seems are unsure if you qualify. So if you haven't had a conversation, you know, with your accountant, CPA consultant, I would suggest you start having those conversations. Um, they're we have seen instances where people didn't think that they applied and then they, you know, found out that they absolutely did qualify. Um, and then D, I think we, we can relate here where a lot of our clients had a lot of headaches with the PPP loans. They did not want to go through um, having to work with the government in trying to figure out what the double dipping impact could be um, because it could have been significant to both their indirect cost emissions, any kind of forward pricing that was done, um, their rates, you know, they wanted to make sure that they were stable over time. And so they chose, you know, not to go down the road of getting any PPP loans. And so others are also choosing not to go down the road of getting any you know, employee retention tax credits. Um, and then the last, you know, we, you're, you are concerned um, related to the impact again to the government contracts very important here to understand how all these credits do impact your government contracts. You don't wanna put yourself in a position where the government could question really those costs and it impact any contracts that you have or any future contracts that you could be awarded. And so you really wanna think through, you know, are we doing this right? Are we really having those conversations with our contracting officers? Um, what kind of follow-up needs to be done. But again, there are companies and businesses that we have seen that are going down these, the path of you know, applying for these loans, qualifying, getting them refunded, um, and then as well as the employer retention tax credit. So keeping that in mind that you, know, you are a government contractor, you have some other obligations, but you could have some other options depending on the types of contracts I think you have as well. And so then how, um, how and when do you account for this employee retention tax credit on your financial statements? Um, some of you mentioned you've already requested the employee, reten employee retention tax credits. How do you then account for these on your financial statements? Um, the AICPA issued a memo not long ago that basically provided two options here. Um, one, you can follow ASC 958-605, which probably doesn't sound familiar to most businesses, and we'll go through that on the next slide. Um, and then this, they also noted you can follow IAS 20 as an option here, um, which was similar to the PPP loan. And so we'll just go through that as a reminder in a minute. And so what is ASC 958-605? Like I said, it probably doesn't sound familiar to you. It is the FASB accounting guidance for non-for-profit um, revenue recognition. However, they are you know, allowing you to potentially use this guidance to help go through whether the, the credit should be recognized here. Um, but you have to meet certain conditions um, for that employee retention tax credit to be recognized. Um, the, any, the entity has to be adversely affected by the COVID pandemic. Um, 
the entity hasn't used qualifying payroll for both the PPP, PPP loan and the employee retention tax credit. Again, no double dipping from the, the cost perspective of you can't have the same cost for both of these items. Um, the entity incurred payroll costs to retain employees. And so that's one of the the items as the COVID funds were being provided as they wanted to make sure, you know, that you were able to retain employees during the pandemic. Um, and so you, if you do go through this and you feel like you meet the criteria, um, you can recognize the employee retention credit income in the period that you determine that the conditions have been substantially met which will require you know, an assessment to determine whether the process for filing for the credit is more than um, or only an administrative burder, burden, barrier or burden um, to receiving the credits. And so you are confident that you're gonna get the refund, um, that there's really no question there, it's just needs to be processed by the IRS. And then similar to the PPP loan that we discussed earlier, IAS 20 is also an option where um, there are some significant hurdles here to be eligible to account for the employee retention tax credit as an in-substance grant. Um, you still have to go through that reasonable assurance that you will get refunded those credits um, and that you've met all of the requirements in the, in the um, guidance from the IRS, including, you know, that piece that you do qualify for. And so you would record, similar to the PPP loan, you would record that income um, on the income statement in that other income piece or as a reduction of the related expenses. Um, you would also have disclosures related to whichever accounting method that you choose here. Um, and so again, that would need to be consistent if you have employee retention tax credits that are being um, refunded from different periods here. Um, and some clients have chosen to take a very conservative approach um, and really record the revenue when the cash is received. And so if there are questions about eligibility and it's not really an administrative burden here, um, you'll want to go through really having documentation to support whatever accounting policy that you do follow or position that you're taking, um, because it could be a significant impact to your financial statements. Um, some of these credits are large um, for some of the entities that are requesting them. And so also keeping in mind that the government is going to be looking at that employee retention tax credit from a double dipping perspective. So in addition to just making sure that you don't have that double dipping between your PPP loans and the employee retention tax credits, um, you also need to make sure that you aren't receiving government you know, funds or these refunds credits for costs that the government is also reimbursing you. So the government, of course, wants its fair share of the credit if you're going to be submitting. And you would go about following the same idea, similar to how you know Dave mentioned related to the PPP loan um, and how those refunds are received and, and what costs and contracts that they apply to. Um, Dave went through an example of what this might look like. However, you know, keep in mind that again, every contractor may look different and you will have, you know, some discussions along the way of how these credits will impact your company from both the indirect cost perspective or any potential future um, rates that you could have. Um, again, just knowing that these credits would get pushed through on your indirect cost submission once the refund actually happens, not when you're submitting the 941 X's to the IRS. Um, there's a lot of our clients, like I said, not choosing to deal with the potential double dipping issue. However, there have been some clients very successful in, in claiming both that PPP and the employee retention, employee retention tax credit, especially 
when they might have, you know, commercial type contracts or fixed price contracts where, um, as Dave mentioned earlier, there might not be an impact because you have these type of contracts. Um, and so where it does become more tricky is when you have those toss type contracts, um, you want to just make sure that you understand what that impact could be to your company. And Amy, I believe we have our last polling question here. All right, so the last question is, what's your biggest compliance concern with obtaining the PPP and ERTC funds? A, reporting to the government, uh, B, long-term impact, C, having to pay the government back, or D, not concerned at all? And we'll leave this up uh, for a little bit to make sure everyone that needs PPE can get their credit for today. All right, it looks like most people have responded. So here are the results. Thanks, Amy. Yeah, not surprised here. Again, a mix of answers, um, just a lot of concern from everyone. Um, and then some people maybe not concerned at all, um, guessing maybe some of you just didn't go down the road of getting the PPP loan or applying for any credits here. Um, but some of you do kind of fall into these other categories where you do have reporting to the government. Um, and again, knowing that a lot of this is new, the DCA may be looking at your in cost, you know, your submissions for the first time, um, that you might have your rates being impacted for the first time here. And so really understanding the impact to those rates um, and what you can provide back to the government to support your position. Um, long-term impacts, we have had lots of conversations with our clients about what the long-term impact to those rates could be, even as you're proposing on future contracts. Um, and then having to pay back the government obviously is a big deal. And just making sure you know you have the, the cash to be able to pay them back and when that timing you know should be paid back. And so having those conversations, like we mentioned earlier, with your contracting officer is really important to understand all those pieces. And I can uh, I can answer a question or two here since we have time. And the first question I'll uh, take here is one that came out and it said, will DCA try to uh, and apply the foregone discount policy in FAR 31 if I do not apply for the tax credit if I could have gotten. So will DCA try to apply the foregone discount policy in FAR uh, Part 31 if I did not apply for the tax credit I could have gotten? And I'd say, it, I would say it's a potential, but the thing is, is that you need to actually go out and apply and if you didn't go out and uh, try to get that, that is a decision you made. Maybe you didn't need to have that, but uh, I would probably push back on that if that started. If they started coming there saying, "Hey, you didn't go for a you didn't go for a credit that you could have been eligible for," uh, there's nothing there that forces your hand that says you must do so. That uh, you can have them try to assert that, but. Uh, these are something that you make a business decision on whether you want to uh, apply for it and uh, the benefit it's uh, the benefits uh, that you could have derived from it itself. It's something you can you can push back on. I can't say that DCA won't try to do that. Uh, they could try to uh, come forward on that, but I would definitely push back on it uh, as far as that goes. I could also take another question here too. Um, and this is one, if we have uh, government and commercial contracts, and oftentimes you have both, uh, you have government, you have fixed price contracts, you have commercial contracts, and we're applying the PP funds to the commercial non-governmental cost, uh, 
do we have to account for the PPP uh, on uh, on I believe the on the ICE submission uh, PPP forgiveness on the ICE submission? You can put that generally. You see on the um, on the ICE submission, you just see a one line that says commercial, and if you're applying the PPP costs against the commercial contracts, which is where you might have actually needed to have those costs applied because of the particular difference in the government and uh, the commercial operations. And it could be that you're able to continue the government contracts and continue progressing on that where the, the commercial contracts you could not. So if you have to apply for that, what I would recommend is putting that down in the ICE model itself and have a narrative with it saying, we needed to be able to apply these to the, gov to the commercial contracts because that's what the greater need was. And I think is being able to uh, express that and justify that with uh, DCAA and maybe its questions it may have during its adequacy review of your incurred cost uh, submission. And when it's asking those questions, it may come back and ask that. But you may have that situation that you were able to continue with the government contracts, you were not able to continue on with the commercial contracts, and you be able you are able to sit there and say, hey, that's what I needed to do. I'll go ahead and address one. Are they still accepting 2020 and 2021 forms? I'm assuming this applies to the employee retention tax credits and the 941 X's. Um, so again, the IRS did come back and say that employers have three years from the date the original return was filed or two years from the date the taxes were paid. Um, to file an IRS 941X. And so, again, some of you might be coming up against that deadline as it, as some of those taxes are paid um, either quarterly or during payroll runs. And I think I can take another question here too. And it has a question is, do I have to account for the ERTC on the incurred cost? And uh, do I have to account for the ERTC on the incurred costs? And I would say, yes, you need to show uh, what you apply to for, uh, apply to to, whether it be the government contracts or you whether you did it to the commercial contracts. And once again, it's, it's looking back at that premise, the foundation of all this, that FAR 31-201-5 credits, that one whole sentence, basically, you know, showing that if you got a benefit of a loan forgiveness, whether you got the benefit of the ERTC tax credit. It's the one thing that you're going to have a issue with is that you may not be able to marry that up well in your financial statements because the fact is it's going to be perhaps in at least one client I mentioned before that they had a PPP loan in 2020 and they didn't get the forgiveness letter until actually 2022. And the thing is that you may have some delay in also the ERTC. So being able to show that. Uh, and that's one thing that you have to consider as far as that, uh, whether you use the employee uh, retention tax credit, uh, what that really got applied for against and what uh, what kind of impact that has to your cost type contracts or the material portion of your time and material contracts. And then to answer another question, um, since some of the employer retention tax credits may refer to a period where the DCA was already filed, when should the credit be taken in which year? I'm assuming this means the indirect cost submission. Um, so again, going back to that FAR 31-205-5 um, credit line that Dave alluded to several times throughout the presentation, um, that would be taken in the year that the cash is refunded. And so just keeping in mind, you know, what costs relate to those refunds and, and then looking at your contract mix to see how that could apply. Again, it could be different for each company depending on the types of contracts that you have and how that refund is, is, is taken um, in your submissions. And I can take another question. 
uh, does the guidance apply to organizations that receive government cooperative agreements? Uh, does the does the guidance the one I showed uh, the two guidances that were DCA apply to organizations that receive uh, government cooperative agreements? If you're subject to a different cost principles than FAR, uh, for example, OMB Circular A122 uh, in its cost principles. Uh, generally a liberal or liberal on that, but the fact is there's probably something that applies in those cost principles that has uh, a near equivalent to the uh, FAR 31 201-5 credit. So it's something to take a look at and whether you have something that is very similar to that. And if you do in the cost principles you must adhere to, uh, take a look and, and, you, and follow that uh, particular cost principle. But I could see the a similar premise being there that uh, one to prevent from a double a double dipping and two two to provide the fair share of the government credit against its contracts so that you're not picking it up again you know through the billings and then you picked it up through either a uh, a loan forgiveness or a particular uh, uh, tax credit. And then another question. So if I got a loan and did not end up needing it, did I commit fraud? Um, this is a really good question. We've seen a lot of clients kind of go through this process of doing the application. They didn't end up needing it because their business actually did very well. Um, so they maybe paid the money back. Um, and so if you went through the application process at the time, you met the necessity you know, requirement and did it in good faith, um, there really should be no question from the SBA perspective, as long as you can document and support really, you know, that you got the loan based off that need at that time, you know, when that application happened. And at that point, you know, when that pandemic started, a lot of folks didn't know what was going to happen, good or bad. And so they really felt like they could, you know, use this as a way to help them and kind of get through that, that unknown. And I can take another question, and this is a question that was emailed. Uh, can a firm uh, not do a credit due to an economic hardship, even if the loan was forgiven? Can a firm uh, not do a credit due to the economic hardship, even if the loan was forgiven? I would sit there saying, if you were if you were forgiven that, you, the government still has, uh, it should be receiving its pro rata share of a credit. Uh, because in fact, you could then actually be getting paid twice through your through your uh, flexible contract billings, whether it be a public voucher, uh, an SF 1034, uh, but to, and also through the fact that you were forgiven. I believe the thing is is that if you receive the credit to show it uh, to show that you had that um, uh, credit, show it, show it, and, and be truthful about uh, the fact that you had it and that you are showing the pro rata share of the credit itself. If you're having some economic hardship, that is something you can always address with the contracting officer uh, and let them know that it is, whether it's, you're going to have a, uh, whether there could be some change in the credit or something else that can be done uh, to have uh, almost an equivalent uh, uh, pay plan for the credit itself. But to let the contracting officer know that you're still having an economic hardship, but Again, try to show that. Try to show the credits available to uh, the in the incurred cost submission for your um, for your uh, cost type contracts. All right, I believe we are at time. Um, so thank you, Dave, and thank you, Sheila, uh, for a great presentation today. And I also want to thank our audience for being engaged and for submitting all of your questions um, to help guide the conversation. If we didn't have time to get to yours, we will do our best to follow up with you after the webcast. And then also, if you met all CPE requirements, your certificate is available to download now in the CPE progress window. And a copy will be emailed within three weeks should you have difficulty downloading it now. And as a reminder, if you attended today's presentation in a group and would like to receive CPE credit, 
You must complete the group attendance sheet found in your console. And uh, finally, here is a link to an online survey where you can provide feedback for today's presentation. And thank you for joining our webcast. We hope you'll join us again next time. And take care, everyone. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all.